the honours of mortality. The brilliant talent which has quite lately and quite suddenly arisen to devote itself to the use of the day or of the week in illustrated papers, the enormous production of art in black and white, is assuredly a confession that the honours of mortality are worth working for. Fifty years ago, men worked for the honours of immortality. These were the commonplace of their ambition. They declined to attend to the beauty of things of use that were destined to be broken and worn out. And they looked forward to surviving themselves by painting bad pictures, so that what to do with their bad pictures, in addition to our own, has become the problem of the nation and of the householder alike. Today, men have begun to learn that their sons will be grateful to them for few bequests. Art consents at last to work upon the tissue and the china that are doomed to the natural and necessary end, destruction. And art shows a most dignified alacrity to do her best, daily, for the process and for oblivion. Doubtless this abandonment of hopes, so large at once and so cheap, costs the artist something. Nay, it implies an acceptance of the inevitable that is not less than heroic. And the reward has been in the singular and manifest increase of vitality in this work, which is done for so short a life. Fittingly, indeed, does life reward the acceptance of death, inasmuch as to die is to have been alive. There is a real circulation of blood-quick use, brief beauty, abolition, recreation. The honour of the day is forever the honour of that day. It goes into the treasury of things that are honestly and completely ended and done with. And when can so happy a thing be said of a lifeless oil painting? Who of the wise would hesitate? To be honourable for one day, one named and dated day, separate from all other days of the ages? Or to be for an unlimited time, tedious? At Monastery Gates no woman has ever crossed the inner threshold, or shall ever cross it, unless a queen, English or foreign, should claim her privilege. Therefore, if a woman records here the slighter things visible of the monastic life, it is only because she was not admitted to see more than beautiful courtesy and friendliness were able to show her in guesthouse and garden. The monastery is of fresh-looking Gothic by Pugin. The first of the dynasty, it is reached by the white roads of a limestone country and backed by a young plantation, and it gathers its group of buildings in a cleft high up among the hills of Wales. The brown habit is this, and these are the sandals that come and go by hills of finer, sharper and loftier line, edging the dusk and dawn of an Umbrian sky. Just such a Via Crucis climbs a height above Orta, and from the foot of its final crucifix you can see the sunrise touch the top of Monte Rosa, while the encircled lake below is cool with the last of the night. The same order of friars keep that subalpine Monte Sacro, and the same have set the Kreuzberg beyond Bonn, with the same steep path by the same fourteen chapels facing the seven mountains and the Rhine. Here, in North Wales, remote as the country is, with the wheat green over the blunt hilltops and the sky vibrating with larks, a long wing of smoke lies round the horizon. The country, rather thinly and languidly cultivated above, has a valuable subsoil and is burrowed with mines. The breath of pit and factory out of sight thickens the lower sky and lies heavily over the sands of Dee. It leaves the upper blue clear and the head of Orion, but dims the flicker of Sirius and shortens the steady ray of the evening star. The people scattered about are not mining people, but half-hearted agriculturists and very poor. Their cottages are rather cabins, not a tiled roof is in the country, but the slates have taken some beauty with time, having dips and dimples and grass upon their edges. The walls are all thickly whitewashed, which is a pleasure to see. How willingly would one swish the harmless whitewash over more than half the colour, over all the chocolate and all the blue, with which the buildings of the world are stained. You could not wish for a better, simpler or fresher harmony than whitewash makes with the slight sunshine and the bright grey of an English sky. The grey stone, grey roofed monastery looks young in one sense, it is modern, and the friars look young in another. They are like their brothers of an earlier time. 
No one except the journalists of yesterday would spend upon them those tedious words, quaint or old world. No such weary adjectives are spoken here, unless it be by the excursionists. With large aprons tied over their brown habits, the lay brothers work upon their land, planting parsnips in rows or tending a prosperous bee farm. A young friar who sang the high mass yesterday is gaily hanging the washed linen in the sun. A printing press and a machine which slices turnips are at work in an outhouse and the yard thereby is guarded by a St Bernard whose single evil deed was that under one of the obscure impulses of a dog's heart atoned for by long and self-conscious remorse. He bit the poet and tried, says one of the friars, to make doggerel of him. The poet too lives at the monastery gates and on monastery ground in a seclusion which the tidings of the sequence of his additions hardly reaches. There is no disturbing renown to be got among the cabins of the Flintshire hills. Homeward over the verge, from other valleys, his light figure flits at nightfall like a moth. To the coming and going of the friars, too, the village people have become well used, and the infrequent excursionists, for lack of intelligence and of any knowledge that would refer to history, look at them without obtrusive curiosity. It was only from a Salvation Army girl that you heard the brutal word of contempt. She had come to the place with some companions, and with them was trespassing, as she was welcome to do, within the monastery grounds. She stood, a figure for Bournemouth Pier, in her grotesque bonnet, and watched the son of the Umbrian saint, the friar who walks among the Giotto frescoes at Assisi and between the cypresses of Bellos Guado, and has paced the centuries continually since the coming of the friars. One might have asked of her the kindness of a fellow feeling. She and he alike were so habited as to show the world that their life was aloof from its idle business. By some such phrase at least, the friar would assuredly have attempted to include her in any spiritual honours ascribed to him. Or one might have asked of her the condescension of forbearance. Only fancy, said the Salvation Army girl, watching the friar out of sight. Only fancy making such a fool of oneself. The great hood of the friars, which is drawn over the head in Zuberan's ecstatic picture, is turned to use when the friars are busy. As a pocket, it relieves the overburdened hands. A bottle of the local white wine made by the Brotherhood at Genoa and sent to this house by the West is carried in the cowl as a present to the stranger at the gates. The friars tell how a brother resolved at Shrovetide to make pancakes and not only to make but also to toss them. Those who chanced to be in the room stood prudently aside and the brother tossed boldly but that was the last that was seen of his handiwork. Victor Hugo sings in La Légende des Siècles of disappearance as the thing which no creature is able to achieve. Here the impossibility seemed to be accomplished by quite an ordinary and a simple pancake. It was clean gone, and there was an end of it. Nor could any explanation of this ceasing of a pancake from the midst of the visible world be so much as divined by the spectators. It was only when the brother, in church, knelt down to meditate and drew his cowl about his head that the accident was explained. Every midnight the sweet contralto bells call the community, who get up gaily to this difficult service. Of all duties, this one never grows easy or familiar, and therefore never habitual. It is something to have found but one act aloof from habit. It is not merely that the friars overcome the habit of sleep, the subtler point is that they can never acquire the habit of sacrificing sleep. What art, what literature, or what life but would gain a secret security by such a point of perpetual freshness and perpetual initiative? It is not possible to get up at midnight without a will that is new night by night. So should the writer's work be done, and with an intention perpetually unique, the poet's. The contralto bells have taught these western hills the Angelus of the French fields and the hour of night, Laura di Notte, which rings with so melancholy a note from the village belfries on the Adriatic littoral when the latest light is passing. It is the prayer for the dead. Out of the depths have I cried unto thee, O Lord. 
The little flocks of novices on Paschal evenings are folded to the sound of that evening prayer. The care of them is the central work of the monastery, which is placed in so remote a country because it is principally a place of studies. So much elect intellect and strength of heart withdrawn from the traffic of the world. True, the friars are not doing the task which Carlyle set mankind as a refuge from despair. These bearded counsellors of God keep their cells, read, study, suffer, sing, hold silence, whereas they might be operating, beautiful word, upon the stock exchange or painting academy pictures or making speeches or reluctantly jostling other men for places. They might be among the involuntary busybodies who are living by futile tasks, the need whereof is a discouraged fiction. There is absolutely no limit to the superfluous activities, to the art, to the literature, implicitly renounced by the dwellers within such walls as these. The output, again a beautiful word, of the age is lessened by this abstention. Nonetheless, hopes the stranger and pilgrim to pause and knock once again upon those monastery gates.